beginning with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the visual art center is situated in Tokichi, uh, the unceded indigenous territory of the nation. It, was, it is with gratitude that we conduct our activities on this territory and share experiences with the community. Thank you for being here. Um, Mojan, and I'll do a short introduction of Mojan's bio, which is really simple, but the simple that I've reduced it greatly. <laughs> poet, poet and curator, Mojan completed an MFA in art history at Concordia University. She is curator of research and programming at Artex and is director of Artski, an international series of, of contemporary art conferences. Most recently, she directed a podcast entitled Trajectories for the Museum of Fine Arts. I've known Mojan for seven years. She was a colleague with my wife at the Museum of Beaux Arts. She has been a colleague with my son in terms of a new generation of, of curators, and, and I'm so happy to have her here. Thank you for Thank being here. Thank you so much us. for asking uh, me to do this with you. It's so Thank lovely. You. Just, a, a, just a, a general sense of how this works. <laughs> how this works, uh, I, when I have to show which Etienne Tom becomes with the curator um, to look at 50 years of artist productions of books or standard books. But one of the thoughts I had was beyond Etienne, I could bring in this. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought of what would be an interesting look at this. And I thought someone from our text and Mojan being working there and someone looking at really standard practices of books was a great invite for us to come in. Next week, uh, I'll be having. Um, Etienne really curated along a curatorial line uh, of 50 years what he thought was a, a coherent trajectory and a premise for artist hopes. Um, what I've done with the guests is taken the opportunity to pull things out to give people a chance of manipulating and touching. During the week, students are coming in in classrooms and I'm looking at the students in classrooms. So um, I'll leave it at that. And we can sit down okay. and uh, we can begin our conversation. Um, 
there's like egg, an egg tray and, and lots of books as well. And so there's there's a lot of these kinds of objects in our in their special collections that reflect the the uh, object status and the sort of the the possibilities and the indeterminacy of what a book an artist book is. And I think this exhibition walking in, I was like really taken, um, you know, really my my own framework. I guess I had some limitations because I'm like, wow, okay, these are all books in some way, in some shape or form. And so it's it's really exciting to see an exhibition. Uh, also that this <coughs> and we'll talk about it a little bit through one of the publications, but that an exhibition that kind of is a library in a form in, in a in this form, you know, of of really framing a artist book challenge for me, and I think when we thought about it, Tin and I, was to think of the space as being somewhere between a gallery exhibition, a consultation space, uh, and an archive. And one of the options was, one of the possibilities was to activate the archive. Yeah. And that's what I was really interested in. performance art, we think more, a lot about the body as an archive, and as a body that becomes memory in that space as a walking and living archive. And I think in the end also the opportunity of this body being here with other bodies, being able to consult a physical archive that is performatively driven largely, it becomes really exciting to be able to do that and to think of the archive as something uh, living and always potentially uh, new in terms of where it can go. Um, yeah, so a lot of people come in and say, so where are the books? Uh, I'm, I'm walking through this and where are the books? And I'm just going, well, okay, let's begin by wondering, is this a book, and what is a book, and how is a book? And I think Etienne really did an interesting introduction last week, and I won't go over it, but uh, if you have a chance, go listen to the talk. And he talks about artist books, and the first quote he talks about is, an artist book can be more about art, or it can be more about the book, in the end. And it's like you can go towards the art or towards the book, and in a sense, uh, in this case, we're going towards more the art. So yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but you can see what he wants to talk about by that. And, and uh, the second thing is, forever in my life, either as a teacher, as an artist, and even in my own brain, I was trying to figure out what am I doing, is trying to figure out, I never fit into one thing. It's like whenever I've talked about drawing, I've had colleagues come up to me, art historians come up to me at the end saying, you know, in French, you're going really broad as to your definition of a drawing. And then whenever I'm showing sculptures, people go, well, this is a sculpture, but it's really an expanded sculpture. And I'll, I'll stop there and I'll be blurring of boundaries. Because in the end, uh, I think sculpture in the expanded field and Rosalind Krauss's writings in the 70s were seminal in terms of who we were as young artists, thinking of things much more broadly than the specificity of a modernist definition of what is any of these disciplines. Yeah. That said, the book was probably one of the last things to come into that array of like, oh yeah, this one we can still screw around with, we can still play with it. And not only does it question disciplines, it questions, it still questions its relationship as a document or what it is. And I think that, uh, and I'm just gonna clarify one thing and I think it's important for me just to lay out of this space. That first room over there is the 70s. And as I said to an earlier class, as we move across that, think of finishing your bachelor's degree and starting a master's degree. And that's the little corner there. That's my MFA show and that's an homage <laughs> to Robert Watts. And, and that's the 80s. And then you go around here and you're in the 90s, but that's my first tenure track job there as I began as a professor. And, oh, there, sorry, there in the corner. And this is really a career of having the freedom of being a privileged professor as a tenure track. And when you get here, that's retirement. And so 2019 <laughs> is the freedom that I have to be able to devote this time and this space here. But I just want to go back to that period of the 70s and earlier than that, even my childhood. And what were books? What were the nature of books in, in, a, in a working class? Uh, neighborhood of of immigrants of second and third generation and third generation Italians. And uh, we didn't have that many books, the truth of the matter. And there were a couple, but they were really seminal in that. One of them that I always remember was the illustrated copy of Bronte's uh, Quivering Heights, and that, that book was like, blew me away. And I always thought it was Dodi's illustrations, but they were dark and they were moving, they scared me, and I loved going to them. And that was one thing. And then as a young person, scrapbooking. Scrapbooking, because I was a wannabe football player, or hockey player, or what, and uh, meticulously cutting out and pasting and measuring and scrapbooking forever. Never thought of that till I got to Concordia in the 90s and started teaching, and people 
were playing scrapbooking as the art form that they did along with scenes and all that. I said, oh yeah, I did that as a, as a young teenager and did that a fair amount. Um, but already in the 70s, um, there were things that were within conceptual art and conceptual art practices that were current at the time that were leading towards ideas of what is it to, uh, to inscribe a space or to write things or to journal, document things. Mm -hmm. And I think that the act of writing and inscribing on city streets and the idea of collecting trees and mapping spaces and performing the body were already introducing ideas of what a book might suggest or could be. And in its hands mind, that was clear. It was already setting up the parameters of, of what book arts could be and should be. One of the claims often became was, yeah, you became fluxus when you went to New York and you arrived. And honestly, I did not know when I applied to Rutgers University where I was going. I only had an old friend who was there who had done his PhD there. He happened to be the theoretician of the Insurrectional Art Company in Montreal. I should have known that was going to lead me there. But he was an anthropologist, and I chose <coughs> Rutgers University. And within the first week, I realized not only was I being taught by Robert Watts, by Jeff Hendricks, and by Larry Miller, but that the guests would be uh, Dick Higgins and Allison Knowles, but that 20 years before that, George Machunis was doing the Flux Mask there, and it was the playground for Fluxes. It was where they did all their tricks and games, and it's also where they put their hands on video cameras. Mm -hmm. That's where they were, so they could access it, and that's where they could do all this stuff. That was wonderful, but I would like to contend that there's a lot of Fluxes before I go to New York, and it was in the, in the understanding of what that work meant in its relationship to long history of data and all. Mm -hmm. But it's also the work of, of, of Beuze and of, of EU and all that that I knew in Montreal. But I never was that close to it, being no surrounded by those people. So being given a performance class and saying, we are redoing George Gregg's work. That was, that was, that was a performance class. That was the first performance class. Jeff Hendricks stood up and says, this is a score to do it. And this is before reenactment, so we were literally redoing pieces throughout the history. So that idea of fluxus was central there and became very important because they became our friends in the context. Yeah. Um, I mean, before I go about how yeah. we started to choose some of the, the publications that uh, we ended up choosing to talk about today, one of the first things that uh, sort of brought, like, uh, brought you into my, my sort of attention was was uh, through the younger artists that I've been uh, interacting with. Diop is one of them in the room. Um, Lisa Aziz, who I interviewed for the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, a lot of people who claim that you are one of their greatest mentors. And, <coughs> and so I thought, um, when I was reading Etienne's text, you brought up some of your mentors. And I thought that it would be interesting if you could frame the conversation, starting with talking about who your mentors were, maybe specifically also in terms of the, the, how your artist book practice um, developed, uh, and then that we could end with just your role as a mentor and the, the pedagogical um, nature of, of also documents that, that um, book, artist books are and can be thought of as well. It, it's a wonderful way to begin, and I, I do want to point out that I look around the room and I, and I see people who have mentored generations of artists, so we're, there's a lot of teachers in the room right now who for 30 years devoted their lives to yeah. students. So I'm not alone in that. That of is course. part of the privilege of being a teacher, especially in the, for a long time. Yeah. At least. Um, clearly my first mentor was my brother. Uh, I had a seven year old bro brother who was seven years older than me. And uh, so he was the hippie because he was born in 47 and he lived the life of that life. And he happened to meet <coughs> friends who were Anglos from the East End of Montreal. And they created what was called the Insurrectional Art Company, which is really one of the early manifestations of conceptual art in Quebec. Mm -hmm. And Robert Walker and Mike Hathlin were my friends, and they, they, they were inspirational for me. As a young person, I went to art school going straight from straight high school, and I had no idea what I was walking into. I really wanted some changes in my life. Uh, and I was tired of getting ulcers from uh, doing mathematics, Latin, chemistry, physics, and all those things. Never having taken an art course, and I was an early student at Dawson. And a person there who was seminal was a man by the name of David Gray, who ended up teaching at Boston. He was my mentor. Yeah, and he was a tremendous person. Um, my brother had seen the list of people, and I said, he said, you're going to study with him. I said, why? Who is he? He said, he hangs around downtown. He's British, and he's like, really interesting. He plays music. He takes pictures. He makes films. He does all these things. So I walked into David's class. Sure, he has mentored and influenced people for years. He's passed away, unfortunately, way too young. And he gave a 
course, which is called mirage montage, and it was basically just the ideas of putting together two images and text and image to create a third or a construction. And I remember the scrapbook, because I was good at it, and I made a big scrapbook, and I was using imagery from films and from photography and from art and quotes from poetry and from album covers and all that. And it became a seminal book there, and I kept it all these years. Dawson was a small school at the time. It was barely <coughs> operative on the in DJ, which is uh, the old, the new BIMP archive. And there was a drawing class, a painting class, and a sculpture class, and that was it. Three rooms, nothing else, but really interesting teachers. Uh, would sometimes ask me to take her clothes off to do a drawing class because no, there wasn't enough money for models and things of that nature. But that was, that was more of a myth than a reality. Once I got to Concordia, uh, I was already a good student, and I would say uh, good teachers met me there, and the skills that were developed were the drawing skills, largely from two people, Marion Weichel and, and John Fox. But I think the most seminal person was Irene Breton, who could see what I was doing and interested in us really by 73, which is the beginning of that. I was really tired of drawing the model, which we did a lot of, and tired of doing stripes and flat painting, which we did a lot of, and trying to figure out my way where I was so the comments, and I didn't call it that. I got caught making things, and I realized I am in right situation. So when I did those rubbings, those are all the trees on the street where I grew up in, the 36 trees on QBB Street. They, they literally map out the space that I was allowed to walk until I had someone with me to bring me beyond that. I didn't know I was doing that, and I, I didn't know I was mapping out that space, but I literally went from tree to tree, rubbed them, measured them, photographed them. And I really saw that work as interesting, and fly strips as interesting, and all these things as interesting, and she encouraged that. By the time I got to New York, then I met a slew of very important people. Uh, they weren't that important at the time. I remember going to a show with my colleagues of a teacher who wasn't in this, and it could be Jean Sebastian, but we were going to go see a show at Susan Caldwell. And I walked into the show, and there were so many people in the room, I could see the rich box of paintings. And it was the mercenaries by Leon Golub. Mm -hmm. And Golub was on sabbatical. And I went, okay, so this is this is someone who I can end up working with. So Golub and Spiro were seminal in terms of people that I got to know and work with. And uh, because I taught for seven years after that. And then there was Jeff Hendricks and, and uh, the Foxes crowd around that. And then there was Martha Ross, who uh, was seminal in terms of sitting me down and asking me what I was going to make art about. One studio visit with, with Martha Rossi, which was really interesting. Sat down and uh, I said, so, what's your stick? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I said, well, what's your stick? I said, what do you mean, Martha? I said, well, from what I can see, you're white, you're heterosexual, you're privileged, and you're straight. So what do you want to make art about? It's like, okay, bottom line, I've never had anyone confront me with that. Now I look back and I laugh and smile and I thought, okay, let's... In other words, it was issue-based questioning, it was issues in its market agenda, and that's what we make art about. You can't make it about art, sure. And I was clearly about this. Yeah. So Martha was a very brief encounter, but very seminal in that way. So yeah, those were the clear mentors were there that I can point to and say these were people who, who not only as students, but later on, because I taught at Rutgers for seven years, would be there in our for me, and then they sort of helping me out, and then including me in projects, yeah. inviting me to things. Yeah. Uh, that was a great idea. Arriving in New York, say, well, there's there's a performance at the Judson Church. Come down, come and see me perform. Or I, we need five bodies to do this. Will you do it with us? So that was the kind of thing we did. And what years? Were so 81, 82, 83, 84. So I leave New York in '91. And uh, 81 to 83 is when I do my master's degree. And I, I finished my master's degree with that piece on the corner, which is the Hay Sculpture being born, burnt in Alma. And uh, I get invited by Ron Gashpadus to come and do a, a show. And the last thing I want to be is an East Village New York artist bringing art to Alma. And I'm not in East Village, I'm really in Hoboken. Or actually, I'm in New Brunswick, New Jersey. So I arrive in, in Alma with really not much. So I'm drawing a fish because my dad used to go up north and fish, and I thought this would be the beginning. I make drawings of fish. And I arrive there, and I make a piece based on Alma's dumping of mercury in the uh, Sagni and the appearance of Minamata. And I call the piece Minamata Alma, memorizing the, uh, remembering 
during the uh, 50 years of the beginning of the, the first identification of massive pollution by industry and commerce. And uh, I make the fish that I burn, and I make the human being that I burn, and that becomes the peace that's there. There's no traces left that come back, and, and the peace is over. Um, so I think that answers some of the mentoring, and you've got a wonderful book in yeah. your hands. I mean, you're in New York in a period that is so intense, both in, in terms of like the sort of generational shift of, of art, artist practices, but also in terms of the devastation of the AIDS uh, crisis, but also the collaborative, um, you know, projects and um, and collectives that are emerging and that, that have existed. That are, you know, doing activism through art, and I think this this book that is a, an absolutely wonderful example of this, and it is also an absolutely um, incredible example of what a collective artist book um, is. And you were invited to participate in this. It was um, it was done in honor of the artist Ryan um, Ruzak by his. Jeffrey Henry. Jeffrey Henry. So this was, so Brian, Brian uh, was actually died in 1987, uh, from AIDS. And uh, he was Jeff's lover. Uh, Jeff was a friend, Brian was a friend too. And uh, Jeff in the process tradition went out and solicited one or three pages from over 60 people, 70 people mm -hmm. in the community. So when you look at this, you just go, holy shit, there's like, you know, everybody from those people like Spiro and all, but uh, Fluxus artists, but also just New York artists mm -hmm. were there. You can see the people who were there. And uh, it was a wonderful opportunity because it, this is probably 30 years later from Matunis' initial output, which was to create books by asking people to donate one of something and then putting it together and sending it out. Mm -hmm. That was what Matunis did before he had a space, before I had anything created. Yeah. Is these collectives so you produce 50 of one thing and then you made a book of it and, or, or, or collectibles of it. So this was Brian's book that came out and, and, uh, and that's it. In the end you see my entry and I feel very, very privileged. This is a picture of Brian. Wonderful man and dressed up in his wonderful costume. And Brian passed away and I do, I can't help myself but plug Jeff after that, and Jeff turned, continues to live his life. And these artists, whether it's Hendrix, whether it's Gala, whether it's Roster, are showing, participating, <coughs> and collaborating and curating while I'm a student. Mm -hmm. So they're extremely active in the New York art scene. Mm -hmm. They are present at all the openings, they are going to shows, they are inviting people to do stuff till they die. Till they basically, till they're buried, and most of them have passed away. So that was the kind of connection I got with from these senior artists who are now accessing the international recognition, but involved. So sometimes I always feel like I missed the boat by not being part of the East Village scene, part of the hot sort of youth liberation. But I was I was not doing work. I was carrying sculptures on their back. I was burning pieces. I was doing different kind of work. It could have been looked at, but it just I feel like it. Jeff's second partner and lover and husband did do good in these villages. His name is Sir Rodney Sir. And Sir Rodney is a Montreal And he's an amazing man. Sir Rodney left Montreal in 1976 when I was finishing undergrad. He was finishing the Ecole de Musique. And he went to Concordia to do an MFA. He said, you don't have a bachelor's degree. You can't do an MFA. So he said, fine, I'm leaving. I'm going to New York. And he went to New York and then started the Gracie Mansion Gallery with Gracie Mansion in East Village. Until this day, he is super active in New York, archiving, posting. If any of you are on his blog, you'll see it, and I highly recommend. So that's the succession that he has continued. He inherited Jeff's house, he takes care of his archive, he continues to work on it, and he continues to mentor. And this is Montrealer from the Ville La Salle, who is super active in internationally making collective books, working that way, and continuing this work. So yes, this book is seminal, precious, in many ways, and uh, most recently, the Molinari Ensemble produced a CD of Philip Glass's work. And when you read, when you listen to the Buzak suite, that's who they're for, because they were neighbors in Cape Breton, and they knew each other in Cape Breton while they were living together. And Philip Glass composed the piece for Brian. 
So that's that's the community. There's celebrities, they're, 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 but they're far from being divas, and I got to meet them at points where they were ready to help you and work through. And you also mentioned a, call, a peer of yours at the time, Rosalie I arrived in New Jersey to do a master's degree, and literally the first weekend I get invited by my colleagues to go to a party. And I go to this party, rock party, and the, the band that's playing is called John Wayne. And it's a hard band. So the band's playing away, the drummer and music is really good, and sounding like somewhere like some really funky talking heads. And then the singer comes out. And the singer is African American wearing a skirt, bob socks, and a conch and his big thick glasses and it's William Bogal as the lead singer. And he begins to sing and it's like I've never heard anything like that before. It was somewhere between very really funky language, but it was also a really possessed speech, like a monologue from a, from, from a preacher. And I went to his, and then I just started dancing and then and so at the end the party was on and William came up to me and he said, Where'd you learn how to dance like that? I asked the name like Francois, how do you dance like that? <laughs> <laughs> but I come from Montreal and I've been dancing since I've been a kid and I love dancing. So yeah, it's pretty cool. So from that point on though, he stopped calling me Francois and I became baguette for him. So I was the baguette for him. We studied together, William was a year older than I was. He was working on his thesis, which was on Arthur, which I found interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I saw him do his performances in the 80s in different places all over. Came to Montreal. I moved back to Montreal. William continued doing his crawls throughout Europe, throughout New York City. We would go see his pieces where he'd be chained with dollar bills tied to him, and the police would come and see him all do these things. And then I was at Concordia in 1999, and I thought, which is again that spirit. William's sort of like needing a place, and I get to run. I got the Bath Gallery, and Julie Keller is running it. I said, Julie, I need four days. She said, Why is this? got a show I can do in four days. My friend William will send us UPS artworks and we'll do a show where we'll give a lecture and that'll be it. Fine, it all got taken care of in a week. I got money for the show from the dean and then the, the wonderful administrator Tony Patricio, when I sent him the information, I said, here's the file, here's the poster. And he said, are you serious? It's like, this title, he said, we just gave this guy this money. And the title of the piece was, the, of his William's piece was the space in no the hole inside the space inside Eve Klein's asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and it was basically William indicting Eve Klein in modernity in terms of his white supremacy. And he was just went at it. And he gave, I think, one of the first lectures in the VA on racism, which is one of the pieces that William was talking about a lot. And he did this wonderful performance using white paint and black paint and KY jelly to do butt prints on the windows of the gallery. <laughs> and he was doing butt prints with his pants down and he's wearing a Bambara mask taped to his head. I managed to get Bernard Lamarche in because I knew him and he wrote a review of it. The place was packed because people knew it and that was it, William went back. And then became William Popel, the celebrity that, we, that most people know of him now. He's a world, world known artist who shows in the New York gallery. So yeah, William was a friend and Last time I saw him was at Jeff Hendricks' memorial at, in New York, where again, my wife and I went down for his memorial, and William was asked to speak, yeah. and he talked about uh, Jeff's heritage and legacy. Yeah. And now William's teaching in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, maybe we can yeah. ask a, a yeah. second series of documents that um, I went, uh, and I opened the Paul Flaw file in our collection at Artex, and uh, found these two, um, what would be considered artist book? This is a zine that uh, that actually is not even um, catalog. It just kind of was in in, in Paul Flood file, but it's like a mysterious album that we don't even have a record for. Um, and it's it was for the Hort um, Harunder Romney Gallery. Romney Gallery in New York. So this is the period where you're just about to leave New York, I think, 92? Well, I've left New York and I've been invited to show at the Bronner yeah. Gallery. Yeah, and it's a zine uh, in lieu of a, ca 
catalog uh, for a group show yep. of which you're part of and where the prompt was to uh, create a Xerox drawing. So drawing that can get Xeroxed and then uh, the, it says the, uh, that the catalog is therefore an exhibition onto itself, a site-specific work which asks us to consider the catalog as another active field of potential, which I, again, think is, is a nice echo to this exhibition itself. But can you, can you talk about this? Sure. This is, a, this is a small publication that Stuart Horodner of the Horodner Romney Gallery. So Stuart Horodner was my roommate. He was first my TA, became my roommate, then became my dealer. Mm -hmm. And who's showing in his gallery? William Popel, Jack Whitten, Stephen Schofield, myself. And there's a slew of other people, but those are the people that you would might recognize. And this is the first show I had. We moved back to Montreal in '91, and when he decided to publish this, this is sort of a little publication that he put forward. And it's simple. What I want to show in '92, what I sent him is rubber stamping that had already been part, become part of my work, which is a good segue into the next piece we want to show. So, Horodner curated for all his life throughout having a gallery, then working for a university gallery, then creating, the, or working at the Atlanta Center for Contemporary Art, and the, the, the one in Portland, and now is the director of the Kentucky Museum. Mm -hmm. And he has been, again, within that enlarged community of self-supporting and helping each other out, we've been in dialogue and continue to work together over these years. Great. And then this is another um, um, artist book that appears in our, in the, Actually, uh, here, available? Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, and this is really not lying. It's available. I think there's, Barbara, there's three more left, I think. And that's it. Three. And uh, I, I, I thought I had to wait more, and I went back because Barbara said, People want to buy these, I said, Buy yours. And I went, and I got 10 left. So it's a series of postcards that are put together in 93 for a show at La Chambre Blanche. Mm -hmm. And so, before I go quickly, uh, it's the rubber stamp Robert Watts, rubber stamp of trees, this is the, the early, early 90s, and by some point there are more rubber stamps, which is right there, around the turn of the corner, and then it occupies this body of work. Largely the 90s are involved with rubber stamping. At first, the rubber stamping is on labels, which we on label attached to sculptures, and they become structural hanging gardens, and then suspended forests, and it's in that sense. Sometimes they become mobile where I'm carrying them, like in this one balanced on my head. Sometimes they're affixed to objects and textiles, like that book in philosophy behind you. We can peek at it after. When that one opens up, it opens up like that book, and it has labels on it with stamping on them. Before I get to a full-fledged architectural installation, I get invited at La Chambre Blanche to do a one-month residency. And that proved to be great because I had just, for the first time, maybe the month before, produced a rubber stamp of a big drawing, which was this drawing, which was about five feet by five feet. And it was done by using the rubber stamp but using a stencil to make it that I cut out on paper. So this was the Biennale de Stamp back in 93. And when I did this piece in 92, I realized I can now do this on walls and ceilings and floors all over the place. So I started at La Chambre Blanche and I arrived with an assistant for a month and I give her the other uh, sketchbook. And I tell her, cut out every male feet figure, every foot, every hand that you can in a life-size stencil, and I spent one month stamping the interior of La Chambre Blanche, creating life-size horses, animals, and then filling it with mattresses that we find in the lanes because it's the spring, so the red galleries get filled up with wet get mattresses in the space, the walls are getting filled with rubber stamping, and there's bed sheets with text on the bed, uh, with, with rubber stamping on it. Cal Johnson and I, who is the curator, produced a series of postcards where in the back he writes the text, and then we have the Tsiravaya that responds to definitions of words, and we produce a series of stamped extracts of what's on the walls. The show lasts another month after the residency, and during that period we mail out all these 
the artists that I have met over this short period of time and longer period of time, we must mail out about 75 or 80, and they return these things to the gallery transformed, cut up, sewn, folded, intoned. And Ed, I believe you were one of the artists? No. <laughs> someone else was. So, so, so other people were. Other people were. And so they sent it back. And the only thing I tell the people is at the gallery, when you get it, just put them on the mattress. It's, so as you went into the gallery, I had all these transformed objects. And that's the installation that set off at least a dozen large scale rubber stamping, what I call architectural books. Books at the scale of a, of a room that are read with your body because they're on the ceiling, they're on the floor, they're behind you all day. They take time to make and they're clearly put out. And this in lieu of a catalog because we never produced a catalog. So this had the first series of extracts from the walls and then it gives you examples of the postcards. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass them around. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Yeah. And get them moving through the thing and uh, just let them circulate and go there. Do you have no, that's fine. This one is mine, so that'll go and I'll be fine. Your DNA will go there and this will be one that I'll keep there. So and then a little pot, a little uh, cotton envelope thing that was uh, stamped on it. Question, yeah. Can we ask a question? Hey, ask a question. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could maybe uh, uh, quickly tell us how did you move on to, to stamping? Yeah. And you took the rubber well, the first oh, piece, yeah, the rubber, the first rubber stamp. Well, I made a rubber stamp in the in the seventies called Easy Art. That's a simple little guy. And I think I was really going after Ian Baxter and, uh, and 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 anything and the idea of Easy Art. I thought I'm going to stamp everything I do as Easy Art. And I didn't feel anything until I made the Robert Watts rubber stamp. That's the corner piece. Oh yeah, can you talk a little bit about that story? Yeah. So if we talked about Brian Bozak's book. So when Robert Watts is a, a seminal Fluxus artist, he is of the first generation in New York. Uh, he was my colleague, I worked with him, and in 1988 he passed away. So uh, Jed and Larry and those friends, this, and I think Robert had asked, because he knew he was passing away because he had cancer and he had terminal disease, so he said, so he said uh, next year on my birthday, bring all the friends together and we'll do the Flux Lux in Bangor, Pennsylvania. So party in their studio. So I know I'm going to this party at a farm, and I had been to the place because Jeffrey, when 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 Robert died, he said, "I want." You, and I was a student at the time. Well, no, I was finished. I was a young teacher. But he said, "I want you to curate a show of Watts's." That was humbling. Because there I was. I walked into this artist who had just passed away. He was a major Fluxus artist. He lived in the country house, and I went through the house and his jam pack. And I got to do the curating of the show. When he passed away, I said, I'm gonna go to his mailbox. I took a document that is signature. I made a copy of the signature. Open a parenthesis, Watts' seminal work in the 60s is about signature and authenticity. He's one of his beautiful pieces is my favorite baseball team with all the signatures, Mene, Cezanne on them. So he reproduced the signatures of the artists on the baseball. He did neon signs like pizzerias of Michelangelo. Many. So he's looking at the signature and how that signature holds and where it goes in terms of neon, in terms of popular culture and all. So I took his signature and I made a book that had an image of Buddha as androgynous. Buddha standing in front of us, I got from a book as an illustration. And then I did the back view of it, reproduced it as a book, and then went up that day to people. That was my what I came with. And offer people, came up to people and said, would you offer a body part for Robert's spiritual body? And they said, what do you mean? What does that mean? And I said, well, if you offer your right cheek, I'll stamp it. You'll make an X. You'll sign the bottom of your page. And that's all it means. So that's the only photograph of that action is that. That man has just had his right cheek stamped on it. And um, the rest of the 80 some odd body parts are a full androgynous male-female spiritual body for Robert Watts. I spent the rest of the day going around. At lunchtime, I had maybe about 20 or 15, because it was slow, going to see people and all. And in Fluxus Manor at lunchtime, there was an auction to raise money for a scholarship. So I bought wonderful Robert Watts stamps, which I'm very happy I got, and then other people did things. And then my book came up. Well, my rubber stamp came up for auction, and Jeff bought it. And then the book came up, and then two guys started bidding. And everything was selling at about $35, $50.
And then he was 50, 60, 70, 100, 150, 200. And I didn't know who these two guys were. And then the auctioneer was Ben, was ben Patterson, oh no, it was Larry Miller. But then, so somebody in the audience says, why is this costing so much money? And then Larry, uh, Ben Patterson went back and says, it's because it's Robert's spiritual body. And he says, wait a minute, what is it? And then Larry explained it. The rest of the afternoon, people came to me. Because the two collectors, the two people were Francesco Conte and Michael Berger mm -hmm. from the Fluxion. And they wanted it. The biggest Fluxus collector in Italy and the biggest Fluxus collector in Germany. So finally, Michael Berger bought it. <laughs> and he got it. And so what you have there here are the first five pages of the text of the book, because he has the book, and then the postcard from Mika Berger and the photograph of the Fluxion, telling me, dear Mr. Morelli, thank you very much for your book. We like it very much. It's very interesting. So that's, that's the Flux Lux for Robert Watts. So if the Brian Guzak book has all these people's names and their contributions, that's pretty much who was alive of Fluxus that day there and walking around and moving so also their, their body parts. And then there's this. So again, a small press book. So by this point, I'm doing a lot of rubber stamping installations, and I do one in France at the CIA in Limoges. And in Limoges, they invite me to, uh, I do the wall piece, and I do a paper piece. And there's an ed editor there called uh, Sixtus, Les Editions Sixtus. And they produce a small limited edition. So they produce this book, which is a book of rubber stamping. But the book opens up. And then aligns to create a long drawing. So there's one in, so they produce one set in just a regular offset vellum, and then there's another in really nice Japanese paper. So um, they're also available here if anybody wants them, so I'm going to do a sell pitch. And uh, so this is, again, in lieu of a catalog to a show, it's taking the idea, turning it into a small press, and producing this book as, a, as an offset print. I guess this 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 series here, yeah. um, this is something that you produced uh, around the same period that we were looking at. This is a bit later, a bit later, oh, yeah. 2011. 2011. Okay. But in New York. Yes. And you, this is part of the Moonwalk series. Yeah. Um, and it's postcard. You went to the every post station in New York yeah. and mailed uh, mailed these these postcards in on which. You Erase, don't erase, walk, don't walk, talk, don't talk, do, don't eat, wash, don't wash. Basically verbs and the negative, the negative yeah. of that verb. And then so you post them to the Quebec studio uh, with the name of every, every recipient who's gotten that studio. So, the so I start with Paris Rivard and I end yeah. with me. And I'm posting these things. Yeah. And so I, that's when you were in the studio. That's when I was okay. in the studio. So I get the studio in 2011 and I'm doing moonwalks. And I decide that I'm going to start at Southside Seaport, which is the most southern post office. Yeah. And I walk a line linking all the post offices till I get to 210th Street. And then I'm only at 56. Yeah. So I decide to walk over to Brooklyn. I cross over the bridge and I walk under the bridge to get the last three that I need because it's 60. I produce and then I have all these postcards that get, end up getting shown at the map in the, in the Triennale au Niveau du Labeur, where the flags are exhibited and the postcards are presented. That said, these things get produced later through the Fofa Gallery. So Jake Moore, our beloved Jake Moore, who is the love of you missed in Montreal, who was just doing great work in Saskatchewan, is, does an exhibition on research creation for that class. And so we were hosting that class at Concordia, and she decides to produce a box of research creation documents. And she asked me, can I do books of your postcards? So this are all the postcards, front and back, that are here, and then she asks the designer to produce, through Google Maps, all of the walks, from the directions of each, uh, which were the by indicators to get me to go through Manhattan. So again, these exist as a limited edition a box set, and then they, they generate from the postcards, which were a stack of postcards collected, which find the form of a bound book in the end. So I think what we're getting close to is this idea of an embodied book, a book that is really about a kind of 
embodied experience, but also literally addressing that. Yeah, and the and and your walking practice is walking really practice explicit, well. explicit in, in this uh, in this book, which um, I think uh, it leads me to want to talk about a, a very recent project yeah. or a more recent very project. Very recent. Very recent. <laughs> Where you were in uh, Mumbai. Res Mumbai in, res uh, in a residency for a few months, yeah. and uh, you created a document which I I am very fascinated by as as you name it as a book as, as an artist book, uh, and it's a it's a sound recording of a walk that you do with a spatula in your mouth and um, the mic. So the resident, uh, residency was in Mumbai for four months. Um, I had just finished a, a large performance drawing which consisted of uh, making a large circle in the sand and beach by crawling with a spatula in my mouth, dug into the sand and creating a line in the sand. I was mimicking a snail that had done that the day before and I was quite fascinated, so I did that as a large drawing. So I had this idea of a spatula in my mouth, so that was there. And I still had the tension in my neck and I'm crawling <laughs> for an hour, two hours, an hour and a half of doing the piece. And I went to the beach. I, when I was at that beach, it was like, you know, it was amazing because the ocean was there. And it was really, you know, Mumbai is a very noisy city. Okay, so where we were in Bandra was like really cacophony of cars and crows and you know, just sound. So, um, the object that I had in my mouth was a spatula that the lady who was making meals for me used to make the crepes or the small pancakes. So that object really fascinated me and I thought, oh, well, there's what is called a skywalk in Bandra. And uh, skywalk is an elevator that allows you to get to other distant places without going to the ground level and it's over the street. But it's really pedestrian. So I thought it'd be an interesting walk to walk there and I thought this fellow who was there with me had this camera, he had filmed the piece on the beach, and he had this really heavy, but really good oral kind of microphone. So I mounted it on the spatula, and then held it in my mouth, and did this full length bandra walk over the streets. So what you get in the audio talk is the cacophony of the cars below, the sound, the prayer at the mosque. You move through that area, and you end up in a silent kind of area, and then I walk my way back, so it's just an audio book mm -hmm. in that sense. Now, how is it a book? I really think it is like an audio book and it works that way. And what is the sound? What is the language? The sound of the language is just me slurping because I got my mouth filled with saliva and I'm trying to get this thing out. So, and it's just the slurping saliva and that sound is getting captured with all the other stuff. And the beginning is it, cut, start, just to cue it and that was it. So there's not much language there. But I would like to open a parenthesis with what is occurring in this show for me, and it is that it's, it, my read of what an expanded book is very broad. The status of the book now is really in transition and transforming, as you say. So the printed word we don't need to talk about within the digital age, and we don't need to go in what will be its next incarnation. And I'm really interested in just, as an artist, looking at what I can do and what all of us can do and seeing how we can expand this to, to another level. Where we can go with that. Yeah. So that's that's the Q. If you want, you can download the Q song to your phone. Then you can imagine tonight as you're going to bed, listen to <laughs> listen to Bandra and uh, think about <laughs> your. You just imagine you're you're in Mumbai. Yeah, I was actually listening to it on a car ride across town. Oh yeah. And it was unbelievable because there's it's nonstop honking the whole time and. <laughs> Another space in movement and 
you kind of transported in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I think that in that sense, that's what my, that was my intention, yeah. just to get that sense of people and, and just locating it yeah. and having you go through that experience and go in there. Um, one parenthesis there, we're going to take it out, but you see the big book here of uh, who you need, where you remember. There's uh, four notebooks from that same residency in Mumbai, which are questions. So if I'm thinking of the sound that I'm hearing, I'm also dealing with an Anglo white man walking through the streets of Mumbai who doesn't speak in Hindi or Arabic. So getting information is where you eat, how you walk, it's all these sort of three, a verb, a question, and that, or an affirmation. So I listed them and made a list of that, and that's what's been keeping me generating now these new drawings, is looking at these questions as ways of titling and, and, and looking at way of language. So that was an insertion into that sound of language that was there going on there. Yeah, and this idea of, of your silence in this is also something. Yeah, the, du the doubleness of it, yeah. to be, to, to talk about orality and to name it or yeah. to silence it. Yeah. And the idea of, of being silenced by the object. Mm -hmm. And as I pointed out to you in that rubber stamp, the mask that is a very important component from the Inquisition that was put it on so women for sorcery. So when women were accused of sorcery during the Inquisition, they were put on donkey masks on their head and they had a steel rod in their mouth that was silencing them. And in a sense, this idea of forced silencing or the idea of being silenced by something and, and the freedom to talk. Yeah, that's something that's going on in many regions in the world still today. Still today. Yeah, yeah. Two more books I think that I would like to brought because you pulled yeah. them out and I would like, well, they were about the themes. The idea of mentoring. So we talked about mentoring and the people that mentored me. And then Mojan said, like, yeah, but like everyone, a lot of people I meet say, oh, Kansom already was my mentor and all that. And yeah, okay, I, you know, 40 years of teaching, you, you meet people and you influence people. But uh, at some point, a really interesting class of Etienne Pandit Gardif, Anne-Marie Prou, Sabine Rousseau, all these people were my students and they put out a publication. And this was a limited art publication and they came to me and said, do you want to be part of it? And he was like, just the return back to, to Jeff and to that period. He said, sure. So I was really happy to be able to, to participate in refresh, refreshing probabilities. And, uh, and, I, and I liked, you know, they said, we want you to be in the show. I said, so, I'm, so this was my entry, uh, an eye for art. Which, you know, that, I, that you're as a teacher, you're supposed to have an eye for art, right? So that was the beginning of the book and they put it as an intro and the conclusion of the book is my eye. <laughs> so you get the full image of me going like my eye. So this book, and then the, the final one, which is then we can have the Q and A. It's wonderful a series of five rubber stamps that the SIAC produced, which was pairing perform uh, uh, visual artists with poets and asking them to create a rubber stamp together. So it's a simple project, and I was very very. I'm happy to be able to work with uh, Nicole Brassal. Mm -hmm. And if there's a poet that it, it is a huge privilege to, to be able to work with her, she had, she had liked the rubber stamps I've done. So we produced this rubber stamp, and then we made, so that people were able to buy five rubber stamps of these things. So that was a very, what's this kind of inspired kind of thing. But it was a SIAC building in Montreal, and here was the little booklet that you got when you bought them. And each artist was given one of these. So I think we've gone yeah. through most of it, and I think we could open it up uh, to conversation and, and see if you have any questions. Obviously, it's a very select view of what's there, and there's more around. Uh, if people want to ask questions about what we looked at, or want to walk around and take an opportunity of talking individually with me, but let's open it up right now for, is, are there any questions about what we did? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Love the work. It's very joyous. All the colors, which is not usually what you think about when you have a book. Book is usually just text and splash and and, uh, yeah, and here it's so so joyous. I like. I'm just wondering in terms of your um, commitment to making a book. Uh, obviously, as artists, you start with the essential of the work. At what moment in time do you? Because you've done 50 years of it. At what moment in time you felt you were committed committed to? Yeah, I think I think that really because.
becoming conscious of it, I think, is around the end of the 70s, but I, when I get to the Watts piece, it becomes literally about bookmaking and the, the idea of like sequencing. But in the 70s to the 80s, those eight fly strips, I really felt they were inscribed with uh, a text in them. I had brought them to a saxophone player for him to play them. I really saw them as a kind of writing, and I really didn't know how I was going to keep them together. And then I realized that th one of the stories about that is once I realized that the fly strip was the size of a 120 millimeter film strip, and that it could go right into the enlarger, I didn't need a camera. So I could just, just project it and go get what I wanted. So I produced these 77 small slides, and that was really a kind of slide show with six texts in it. But it was projected at the Musée Joliet as a continuous thing, but it was really a projected book. It had, it had a sequence of texts in it, it had a conceptual space to it, and it had a duration of the number of weeks that were there. So it's, and then it was working through print media with Irene Wichon that was going at it. So that really gave me a sense of that, was like the potential of a book that could go there. Then, the, honestly, it's the same thing with printmaking for me. I was never a printmaker till I came back here, and I got, started getting invited by Catholic Circular, by Sagami, and I was like, but I'm just not a printmaker. Like, why are you inviting me for this? And because I have a lot of drawing, I began to really allow that to become, and became committed to printmaking as edited prints. Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer would be two way. One is conceptually, very early on, I understand the notion of sequencing and books, how they can be made. And then when I realized that to get this to the next level of editing them, producing them, then it began to be who I was collaborating with and where it would go in that, in that idea. And I never let myself be limited to if I had the money or if I had the partner, if I had the collaboration to make more. So I realize now that a lot of these single books could become multiples or could be edited and all that, but I just produce them right now because I, I'd rather do them. It's a studio-based practice that doesn't want to get boggled down with craft in the sense that I just want to let the ideas go through it and work. Although craft is what generates most of my work in terms of heavy investment of making and like taking time to make it really beautiful. But um, just before the show, I started thinking, oh, I've got to approach the, uh, Madame, uh, at Tranchville to make these selected boxes or to box some of these things and turn them into quote unquote precious articles. And that's, and that's not the one I'm going to do. What's more important is they exist as a collection, they exist as a portfolio. And to top it all off, when the BNQ bought a book of that nature, I said, really? I said, all it is, it's not bound, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have a coliform, it doesn't have, they said, fine, we don't want that. We want it in that state. We are going to put it into a box. It exists as a book that way. We don't need it to be fully boxed. Actually, we unbox it when we take it. So that's, and if that answers it in a sense, maybe. It's really at the collaborative level when it gets edit edited and produced more, and it really becomes something different at another point. Uh, the dollar bills, again, it's serial. I know from the moment I do the first one that I want to do 100, and just because I'm going to have 100, 100 trees equals $100. That's my logic, right? It's like, it's like ripping from Warhol to just 100. That's, that's normal. But the end is like getting to 100. As to get to this, I, I realized when you're making a book, you gotta get to that end of it. You gotta finish the task. And uh, I think in answer to that question, I've been, uh, over the last two days, I've been thinking, the other day, I guess it was in a sense, it was a, I don't know which one I would say it, a response to uh, Richard Serra's What is Sculpture? Right? There's all those verbs, right? So I said, well, let me think of what did I just do over the last two years or all my life, which is to roll, to cut, to stack, to fold, to sew, to bind, to line, to align, to strew, to file, to spray, to span, to order, to date, to box, to title, to tear, to score, to organize, to lay out, to grid, to sequence, to number, to erase, to clean, to measure, to mark, to do, to take, to lay. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, that's what a bookmaker does in the end, but I just didn't do it in, in the right sequence. <laughs> that you would imagine what a bookmaker does, but I actually do all those things. But more often than not, people will come into the room saying, where are the books? <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, yeah, that's the whole point. And Etienne got that from the beginning. And Etienne said that first tree piece is, is a book, it's a walk, it's all those things. And it's a scroll, I always saw it as a scroll. And I think that was a really important thing. 
Other questions? talk our text, we talk here, we talk this moment, this show, and I'll just enlarge it to Montreal, Quebec, and Canada, and the heritage that we have had of being able to create those centers, mm -hmm. and to create those communities, mm -hmm. and that's to, keep the, to keep them going, yeah. Yeah. And, and to fight for them to keep on growing, because in the end, that's the legacy. The legacy is of artists run centers, is of, the, of, of our activities as artists in tandem with researchers who are historians, who are librarians, who are, and we've managed to create this community that has made the world envious. Mm -hmm. When I said Martha Ross to ask me those questions, she asked me one question before, what's your state? She said, why the hell are you in New York? Mm -hmm. I said, why? She says, I know where you're from. I know Montreal, I know Toronto, I know Vancouver. Why the fuck would you want to come to New York? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and she would tell me the same thing today. <laughs> In the end, is like people, you know, we live in, we, we've gone through a, an amazing period where we'll be confronted with hard choices in the future, but we still benefit. And right now, the resonance from the younger generation is coming from the rest of the world. We have the Canadian Quebecers of third, first, or whatever generation, but those who are arriving for the first time as refugees or not are finding a place as artists to make their work. Not many countries where that can happen, where they can access education and all these things. So I think that's huge. And what you're saying is that is a society and a community that can open up. Thank you. And next week is the IMP, which again, when I tell my colleagues, the IMP purchases every first edition of as the Depot de Gare, and they go, really? Yeah, if you're a printmaker, your prints go to the IMP. You're supposed to give them these, and they will take that. And they collect postcards and newspapers and things of that nature and sketches. Incredible. Yeah, and incredible art spaces. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I've been trying to practice non attachment to my own work, even what I've done yesterday. Could you? And it's really difficult for me to wrap my head around archiving my own work and even the whole. Mesmerizing how orderly things are here, and I admire that. So, how does that work? <laughs> uh, it's funny because you say that, and then and one of our common, very dear friends, David Elliott, said, So much for ephemera. You seem to have the whole thing really down. You collect everything, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like performance art has no trace. And yeah, I, and I said, to, and I, as I said, I think in the first uh, visit, um, I don't know why, but I became very aware that what I produced, yeah. I wanted it to be important. 
I think, and I realized that it might not be important now, but it might be important later. Mm -hmm. Number two, I was supported by a family and parents who believed that. Mm -hmm. So much of that stuff was on, literally under my parents' bed in a four and a half room flat in Hôtel de Maison mm -hmm. or in the basement. Yeah. And then when I moved back to Montreal, I had the privilege of being in the same studio for 40, 35 years. Mm -hmm. So I just bring it in some studio. It's there. And that's privilege, I know. So yeah, uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, organizing, yeah, I'm methodical. David said anal, I don't know if I'm gonna go there, but I think so too. And it is important about that. And then when I realized that even the loosest and most improvisational artists that I knew and I met who were like 60 years old or 50 years old and young, their systems were down, their archives were down, everything was down. And the best and worst of them were the Fluxus artists. Especially people like, well, John Hendricks, if you look at the codex of Fluxus, and if you went to John's house and we lived next to Jeff, it's like the archives are laid out. They're there and they're all organized. And by the way, he organizes and takes care of, he's the custodian of Okio Gorono and John Lennon. So it's like, it's, it's, it's major figures in popular culture and all. But he realizes that things have to be organized and things have to be put in place. So it's just, I guess, the respect for what you're going to do. And it's, uh, it comes with, I think, older cultures also. When I traveled in Europe, a show like this might seem like an anomaly in terms of a look, but in terms of an artist book or an art, a, a dealer was interested, works on paper, an artist book, this is a, a show in Cologne, this is a show in, in Basel, this is a show in, in Italy. <laughs> so to have dealers who just work with works on paper, just artist books or collectors who do that, so these things have to be codified, they have to be organized, they have to be preserved. And I had an assistant from, Limoges, uh, from the Lyon working with me this fall. And I said, what did you learn in three months? De faire attention des choses. <laughs> Même quand je suis étudiant. Mm -hmm. And I would say surtout quand tu es étudiant. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Bruno, for the generosity of, of, of showing us all this work, of more just having <coughs> this conversation that we've been here. Uh, thank you also, Karen, for what you said. So many people here around our text. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, and I also totally agree, I mean, obviously, um, that, yeah, people keep things, you know, and that's okay. And you preserve them. And when we speak about body as archive, archive memory, body, we also change all the time. So these things are like skins that we leave and they're part of us and they come back. And I think no show shows this better than your show. So, like, now it's a beautiful exhibition. And, and also, you hear you talk. I, of course, also think about when we think of right now, you know, um, I just want to, I don't want to, when we think of right now, how we just, we're just, I, I always feel like as an artist or a curator, we're just starting to maybe grasp, a, you know, one millimeter of what the hell happened in the last three years. And I feel like that sense of isolation and the joy of being with colleagues, friends, people you know, don't know, is so precious when, so then, when it then comes to having this possibility to look at something and the performativity of that as well as the gesture. And I think, I think that leads me back to this thing of the digital, you know, because nothing is more actually ephemeral than anything digital, because any file that you put into a computer in 2002 basically does not exist anymore. It's like, Gone. You, you think you're saving something on your hard drive or Dropbox, and truth, it's like, <laughs> and you can probably access it a few times later, but in two or three years with the business of regenerate. So I sometimes wonder about that. How do you see that, the digital? Like, how do you use that? How do you resist, embrace, work with, work against? Um, it was, it was and maybe you, and also, Cam I mean, there's Cameron some of the artists. You know, DRs. Yeah. I mean, there's so many great artists. Like, how do you guys deal with that? I'm just really wondering about that as myself. I'll be short on it because the end, there's a BC and an AD for me. Okay. So in other words, when when the digital arrives, it's a practical thing. It's like when young curators come to my school, what do you do with all these slides? I said, it's all analog. Everything was equally documented and was analog. And I still have the pincement when Guy Leroux says, I'll send you this on a disc drive, which is what he just shot here. I was just like, it's not tangible, I don't have it. So that's the first thing, but it is like, 
before and after, mm -hmm. and it changed my teaching rapidly. Yeah. I was taught, no, but I was hired as an interdisciplinary professor at Concordia. That's literally was my, it was the first time I could get a tenure track job because I never got the other jobs in painting, drawing, sculpture, because I did all those things, but I wasn't, they, they didn't hire me, I got to the short list, but I never got the job. Concordia was the first to hire, the only time they put a listing up saying, artists working in three or more of the following disciplines. Mm -hmm. I applied and I got the job. I stayed in that position for six years. In those six years, that program area went totally digital. I was looking at the program that had been embodied and I was going at it, and the first thing I did at the end of that first term, I went to my chair at the time and said, I want to, I want to be moved to painting and drawing. I want to be in drawing. And I went to drawing. And from there, every person who took my drawing class, and this is like an interdisciplinary class. I said, yes, but with drawing at its base, writing and scripture. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, but it's not. Okay, so that's the, the next thing. And the next thing is, I still am all thumbs on the computer. I still need someone of their generation to help me with my editing. Leila Mestadi edited 20, 15 of my films recently. Right. I'm working with somebody else to work on others. So it's like, for these people, I'm in admiration of them because they come in at the c chef level and they're digitally already there. They can handle all that. But the archive for me is, and then, just because you know him and a lot of other people know him, my son is the antithesis. Yeah. He does performance and he wants no physical trace. Yeah. He wants just, in some odd way, he's back to where yeah. the 50s were. Well, why you wait and see? <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe not, but the point, is, is that, the point is, in the end, is that where is the doctrine, what is the truth? I go back to that because I think that the earlier performances out there in 74, black and white photograph, you know, uh, Etienne was saying, he was looking at relational aesthetics as the photo was so bad. I said, they're not bad, they're just analog. <laughs> but it says, no, it's like, in a sense, it's like they're not digital. You know, you were saying that the other day. But it said that, yeah, it's true, it's the 90s. It's pre-digital with all the performative there. There's people handling cameras, and, they're, and then they're, they're producing them out. And in the end, by, by the millennium, everything's formatted. Everything comes out. And it's, 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 it's in a different way. But anyone else want to respond to Barbara because yeah, in sure. relation to the digital yeah. parents? Oh, What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you know, but maybe you do know that the government is pouring tons of money yeah. into having things uh, yeah. digitized. Yeah. And I'm sure you must know exactly what you just said that in yeah. two years we're not just going to have access to the research or yeah. any yeah. 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 And it's almost like the money should be going the other way. Yeah. The digital is is in a certain sense the space of, of sharing. And accessibility, right? And I mean, we shouldn't all just minimize that. There's also accessibility. Not as accessible as, as, as we tend to think. Yeah, but. But yeah, but for sure. If I intention is there. I from somebody who put them on an Instagram account from all around the world. If they have the ability to have that mm -hmm. sort of in their person. Mm -hmm. but, um, but on the other hand, it's, it's going to be lost. It's all mm -hmm. like. Well, that's why I think, Hélène, your work that you've been doing yeah. at Artex, but now I don't think so. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> and what you've done at Artex and Sarah, you guys have done it with like the whole the workshops you've done, yeah. you should have and such websites and all that you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all a process because like for me, digital is like you never have the answer for the first time. So yeah. it's just like thinking process and it's often struggling yeah. or even in quick time. Hired at 
before here, I came with the first few years a large research grant, which you get as a new professor. And um, I, I asked for money because of my, one of the women I was mentoring and I had mentored is Suzanne Lebel. I had studied with Suzanne, I had taught Suzanne at Fort Gay, who had a PhD already in philosophy. And crazily, she pursues a second PhD at Concordia. So she was finished in her PhD at Concordia, interested in databases. So I proposed that she would work on my website, which would be a database. And she was interested in architectures of knowledge. I, I, was I had to defend it as an artwork. They would not accept it as, like other people asking money for uh, RAs, uh, Canvas, uh, stuff. And I wanted her to do a database. And she did. And my new people accepted it. The truth of the matter, now I'm stuck with it because I can't move it anywhere. Not anyone else can handle it. <laughs> It's like it's so complex because it's a it's a alphabet driven, it's theme driven, and it's it, and and it's and everyone the persons who hate it the most have been the people who have represented me commercially because they can't sell from it. You can't find a work. You can go through a theme or an idea like you hit T, it goes T tree, you go tree, and then you have tree over forty years. And but that's not good for the person who wants to have the piece from nineteen ninety. That's that or that or thematics. Or, so the idea of a database was something that was having a hard time making it as an art practice mm -hmm. at Concordia. So that's a long, and this is 1998, 99. And her husband had been a hacker at the time, and he was like, he had just been hired by a big company, and he's a big, he did the programming. So, so what you're saying is, I, I totally understand wanting to go to a direction and not having support, tech support or resource support to do it. But I also think that, um, well, it's an interesting idea because I always think that the embodied experience of making your first marks and making your first gestures and that memory and body memory, but then I'm also confounded with the fact that when, from the first time I saw a nine-month-old infant in a mother's carriage trying to expand the image on the cereal box, it's like that, and I'm like, oh my God, and this was like in the 90s, and I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that's sort of like, what is that first experience? Is it the magic of the screen and the interactivity of the screen? And it has nothing to do with this stain or the mark or the, but it's still an embodied gesture. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a confusing place, but an interesting place to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Say that in terms of, uh, I've been following your work for some time, as you know, we've been to. Uh, yeah, and, and, um, uh, and, I, and I've seen segments of your work. To see it all in this way is, 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 is you know, thrilling and, 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 and exciting. But what I really enjoyed more, I mean, like you just really shattered, you know, the, 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 the bracket of, uh, say, a history, for example, or a book, the beginning and middle and an end. You've actually, it's like the purple rose of Cairo, you step out. Of your of your books, of your images, and what have you, and you've enacted and you've animated this. Something that I had not expected, you know, and I'm really thrilled that, that you know this is happening right now. But 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 that that thinking about the digital situation, I mean, you can't get this from that. You could read, you could you could actually connect, you could actually look at pictures or or envision what so and so is doing at one particular point. But this this sense of the moment of the now is just really really magical, and and I I really feel like I really I'm really you know, I really sense it strongly and profoundly right now. So, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And to the two of you, in terms oh, of actually you. getting it together. Yeah. I love the invitations to touch in certain yeah. areas because I think yeah. that's also something we've been deprived uh, of a lot. And, and this, this thing about senses is, is and being able and being invited to participate in, our, in that way, I think is really profound in a way that yeah. is surprising. <laughs> in this, in this, in this crazy uh, gridlock that I was in the seventies, what am I going to make art about? And then at some point, when I go to Rutgers, and the only my goal is like, I'm not going to make any object that's not going to be performative. Everything I'm going to make is going to be used to perform it. That was it. And it's only much later on that I started showing exhibit things. But it was this idea of embodied experience. And when Skull invited me four or five years ago to do a show, and I had just done that bust. I didn't want to just do another show, I turned it into workshops. And we collaborated with our techs, and we did something there. And when, we, when 
this came up as an opportunity. It's like, how can we twist this around and make this a living archive? How can people have Saturdays to come in and touch things and look at things and, and want to go in the box yeah. and the order, the person that this is, come back on Saturday. You can't get in there, but here's the list of all the stuff that's not outside. And when you come on Saturday or come another day, the artists will be here. You come in and then to have classes come in and just do this with them. It's, it's a great way. It's somewhere between what we do as studio visits when, when we have groups coming in. It's something that we do as, as teachers, but as, as, as a way of rethinking curating, mm -hmm. a way of rethinking reception and, and dialogue and, and, and engaging. It takes time, it takes time, but it's, I think it's rewarding. And to have a, an audience like you guys is phenomenal. I mean, you know, like, I mean I've got, for me, I look around, it's like, when I walk into Port of Tech, I want to see you, you know, and that's like where I, where I go. When I want to go to Architects, I want to see you. Then next will be the IG. This is Le Monde Divides de Montréal. This is books. This is theory. This is fiction. This is poetry. This is art. And for you to show up on a Saturday afternoon, the day after a storm, I mean, With your thank, you, thank you. Forget, forget me. Thank me. Thank you for doing it. Because you come back en masse. Of course, you recognize, oh, that's good. I want to go there. I want to see that. Thank you. Thank you.